Welcome to The Aperture, a podcast for curious minds and critical social thinkers, hosted by me, Steph Cutler. If you believe a better world is worth consideration, then you're in good company. Each episode, I chat with someone with views and or experiences of a social issue, and at the end, I hand over to a creative contributor who has the final say. On this episode, I'm joined by Lem Sisse. At the start of this year in the UK's first national lockdown, I had an idea about possibly creating a social change podcast. At the time, I was reading Lem Sisse's memoir, My Name Is Why, and I remember thinking, if I ever do anything with this idea, he would be a great guest. As we approach the end of the year, and indeed another likely lockdown, it does at least feel good that this is the final episode of my first series of The Aperture, and that I am joined by Lem Sisse. Lem will need very little introduction to many. He is a BAFTA-nominated International Prize winning poet, playwright, broadcaster, artist and performer, and... His plaudits really are way too many to mention here, but here are just a few of his achievements. Lem's landmark poem, Guilt of Cain, was unveiled by Bishop Desmond Tutu. Other poems can be found around the world on walls and in public spaces, such as the Royal Festival Hall in London and the British Council offices in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, as well as across his home city of Manchester. In TV and radio, his work is prize-winning. The BAFTA in 2018 was for his documentary Super Kids. Internal Flight was a TV documentary and Child of the State, a radio documentary, both broadcast by the BBC and both about his life. Lem was the first poet to be commissioned as part of the London 2012 Olympics and has written the official poem for the FA Cup. His TEDx talk at the Houses of Parliament has been viewed by over a million people and his Radio 4 episode of Desert Island Discs was chosen as Pick of the Year. Lem was awarded an MBE for services to literature and honorary doctorates of four UK universities, several of which have scholarships in his name. He has many philanthropic activities, but most notably he's the founder of Christmas Dinners for Care Leavers a project that's now national and has been praised by a Prime Minister. If you Google Lem Sisse, the only return hits you will get will be about him. It really does seem there's only one Lem Sisse worth reading about. And then we're joined by Liv Talks, a spoken word artist and producer. She's a Radio 4 Poetry Slam winner. She's a former Bard of Exeter, co-host of the Hip Yak Poetry Shack and the host of the Rainbow Fish Speakeasy. Be sure to stay tuned for Liv's poem, which follows my conversation with Lem Sisse. I'm keen today to talk about creativity and the role of creativity in creating social change. So I'm thinking of this in two ways. I think it can be a means of expression for those with lived experience to share their fears, their experiences and their aspirations. And it can be an incredibly cathartic means of communication. And then more widely, I think art and creativity can provide a platform to be an advocate or to be an activist and to share history and future thinking. And I think within your work, you've demonstrated both of these. So I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. I didn't know I was doing it at the time. And I didn't know I was writing about an, you know, quote, issue at the time or that I was an activist at the time. I just knew that I had a compulsion to express myself about the situation that I was in. And I think that 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 is the fuel that drove me to express uh, myself. I'd say say creativity is, you know, right at the heart of who everybody is. And sometimes it fires up. And I didn't know, you know, when I started writing that it was any kind of activism Mm -hmm. I just knew that something felt wrong and that this was the way I could investigate what was wrong and investigate it 
as the primary witness. Mm. You know, I, I was, I felt like I was experiencing something that other people didn't see. And, and the question to me was, is this happening? Is this real? And by writing it down in a poem, it sort of confirmed for me, yes, this is happening. Yes, it is real. And yeah, that, 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 that's all it was really. You know, later on it becomes that your work sort of finds the public somehow um, or finds a reader or finds one listener. Yeah. And, and then you see the effect it has on other people. And, they, and that seems to confirm that you're not crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, maybe it is a sort of, it, it, maybe it is about mental health as well, because when your core is challenged by, for example, for me, by being institutionalized, you start to ask yourself questions. Is this my fault? This condition I am finding myself in. Um, am I right to be emotionally moved? by this situation that I find myself in? And why am I emotionally moved, strained, pressured in this situation that I find myself in? And so, so yeah, it was a compulsion to write. I felt like I, I had to do it. I had to, I had to write down, uh, I had to speak out. And I guess that is the sort of heart of activism really. Um, what, what's beautiful about it for me is that it was wrapped up in an art form and that art form was poetry. You know. Poetry became the translator of my experience. You know, poetry became the ally in the march for myself. Poetry became the, the mirror in which I could see in 3D um, the world around me. And poetry became the voice through which I could find myself and be proud of myself and connect to the rest of the world. Yeah, and, and speak your truth by, by the sounds of it. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, speak your truth. Yeah. I think, you know, art and creativity can play a role in, in speaking truth to power in quite a unique way? I think if aliens came down to Earth and they wanted to know about um, the human experience, they wouldn't get it from uh, Parliament. They wouldn't get it from ideas of democracy. Um, they would get it through the artists. Because we speak about not just the condition that we find ourselves in politically, but uh, the emotional state we find ourselves in. And, and, and matching those two things together is a very powerful uh, concoction, actually, which, which reflects the human condition. You won't get it from biology, um, you won't get it from physics, but you will understand humanity through artists because they can use biology, they can use physics, they can use chemistry, as well as the emotional state of the human. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of, about poetry and war poetry, of, of, you know, the poetry, the words that were written in the trenches. Um, and and that, that feeds into what you're saying about conditions, but, but very much about emotions and and the humanity of that situation which wouldn't have been communicated in the same way like you say in in from government you know there's probably quite a contradiction there between the words that were penned in the trenches and the words that were put out in government messages yeah there was a difference um the government's uh, messages and pathé news uh, the propaganda was that the war was a great thing um, and it was the war poets who uh, talked about the inhumanity of war and 
the loss and the emotional state of war, and that changed people's opinion on the First World War mm. um, and the Second. And this this is where poets are poets are messengers uh, for the heart, you know. And what, when when our country needs a message from the heart, it often turns to poetry. At funerals, people will read poems. Mm -hmm. Birthdays, people read poems. Weddings, people will read a poem and feel nothing about it. You know, it just makes sense that a poem should be read there. It's because it is a message from the heart. And it cuts through all of the ceremonial practice and the timings and the (laughs) marches and the uh, collective organisation. The poem cuts straight to the heart of every single person that is there. Uh, it's quite unique. It is, isn't it? And, it? and I think one of the other things is that it's there forever. Once you've shared it, it's a, it's a moment in time captured that, that has the potential to have a huge audience or, or indeed a very small audience, but, but an audience that gift stays with. Yeah, a poet can trip themselves up by thinking about their audience too much because if you put the audience before the poem, then the poem becomes institutionalised. It it becomes second-hand because you're thinking about what the audience may like. You know, it's kind of really important for a... Well, for a poet in particular to write for themselves. And um, if the audience listen then that's you know that can be a bonus Um, hence the coming from the heart piece yeah yeah it has to come from the heart it has to come from the heart doesn't matter what it's about it has to come from the heart yeah and i'm right in thinking you believe we're all creative yeah i don't think that uh, creativity is the monopoly of artists you know i think that um the way we deal with problems in our everyday life, the way we carry them, even if we don't solve them, uh, we're constantly engaged with a creative process of how to get through the day. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) You know, um, even right now in lockdown, uh, one of the, one of the dark things about lockdown is that it feels like it's a challenge on our creativity, you know, and our ability to imagine on our ability to, to project, (laughs) Um, it seems like when we're when we're small children we're like really creative and we're really encouraged to be creative and that as we get older I don't know what happens along the way but we start to be less creative or feel like we have the ability to be less creative is education part of that is it parenting what how how does that come about well, I just was thinking about this just as you said it. And what comes to mind is that uh, when we're small children, we are encouraged to play. Mm-hmm. And then we're encouraged to discover while we play. Nobody knows what we'll discover when we have a, a, a Tonka toy, you know. I remember Tonka toys when I was a kid. They were just uh, sort of cars and um, pickup trucks and things. But nobody knows what that child will make of that uh, pickup truck, what story that child will start to tell themselves when they're, you know, uh, pushing it along the floor, where it's going, uh, where it came from, what it's doing. Um, and, and why is the child, you know, um, connected to that particular toy? The child just gets on with it using their own um, faculties. That's got to be creativity right there. Or a colouring book, you know. So, or a cardboard the, box, you know. <laughs> Suddenly it's a spaceship or it's a racing car or, you know, it's a bus. It's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a cardboard box, but it's not. So that's, that's, that's play, you know. And maybe as we get older, we play less. And we invest less in play um, and in improvisation, etc. I mean, art is a kind of play, without a doubt. I know a lot of actors and um, sort of some of the best 
um, really value play in the rehearsal room. Um, and so, yeah, so I've just, I just thought that then when you said it, I thought, yeah, play is underrated. Uh, and play is not unrelated to storytelling either, really. A good storyteller is, is a playful human being with a spark in their eye. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And perhaps over history, probably since time began, storytelling through art, through song, through poetry, through the visual arts has, has been a means of uh, sharing issues around oppression and, and injustice. Um, whether that's they put the, the audience first or not, it, it certainly has. There is that history of storytelling, raising There's issues, raising awareness. There's a beautiful moment when you're growing as an artist where you realise your work connects to somebody else's experience. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. You know, you write a poem about your own specific experience um, and somehow it's connected with another person who has a similar experience and they find comfort in your in the description you have given to your own life. They find comfort to their life from that description. That's, that's a beautiful thing. And, and then they, they will, the poem has a life outside of you. Uh, and that's where it connects with activism and community. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing as well. The poem starts to grow into its teenage years then yeah. To, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it starts to talk outside of you, the writer. It starts to talk to other people and they, and they take it and they show it to other people and it starts to talk to them. And before you know it, you know, the, the poem is the storyteller in itself with people surrounded around it. And you could look from a distance in awe of it, you know, because it's no longer yours. It's become, it's become become an adult and that's yeah, like a, it's got wise with age and it's sharing its wisdom and you you can look as a as a parent might knowing that what you've written has become independent of you mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and that that's really really powerful actually it's very compelling isn't it mm. it must be like when a, a a director has made a film you know, it's very personal to the director, but actually when other people watch that film, it becomes something to them. And it's quite, um, it's quite a joy to watch that happen to poems. Yeah. Is there any, anything else that, that rivals this, this means of sometimes on a, organically, perhaps sometimes less so, but and uh, an idea, uh, an experience gets captured in this way and becomes a catalyst in this way. I'm not sure I can think of it, anything no. that rivals it. As somebody who's been a poet all his life and uh, finds po writing poetry actually more difficult now than he did when he first started, I, I don't think there is anything that uh, compares with it at all. Um, I, I did a poetry reading the other day for Nottingham Poetry Festival for the Metronome, which is a theatre in the middle of Nottingham. And um, I did it on, online. And it was such a beautiful experience because for me, and it personally, because I felt like I was with my friends. Because I've, I've written a memoir, the past year I've been touring and talking about it. But... But this, this, this poetry reading, I, I, I felt like I was, my friends were, I was amongst my friends again. And the memories that the poems hold from when they were written are very personal to me. The poem may mean something to other people, but actually to me, they're very personal. And I found that really a unique experience, actually. It reminded me that you know, your poems can be like flags in the mountainside of your own personal journey and that they hold the memory of the time that you wrote them. And other than a family member who holds a memory of the time that you were growing, there's nothing like it. Um, and that's quite, yeah, it's beautiful, actually. <laughs> 
it's very powerful to hear in that the nature that art can have on us as individuals and those we choose to share it with it seems a shame that we do become less creative um, and and I wonder that in education and, and schooling and as young people as opposed to small children. So the way we learn has fundamentally changed and there's a strong possibility that our whole entire schooling system may change in years to come. How, how, how kind of revolutionary is that? It's already happening. Um, you know, we may not need banks in a few years' time because we'll be doing it all from our phone, like, like in many parts of Africa. All of our transactions can be done on the phone. We don't need to, a, street bank, a bank to walk in on, on the street. Things are changing fast, and um, I think that's a good thing. The beauty of creativity is, and of writing and of um, painting and stuff is that the computer will be able to write beautiful poems at some point. But right now, art and creativity is, is um, the best translator of the human being. Maybe computers will be the best translator of the human being in future. Maybe they are now. But I think Maybe still... they are now? How? Tell well, me. if I was an alien coming down to Earth, like, yes, I could find out about the human spirit through the poet and the painter, the complexity of that and the contradictions of it, of the human spirit and the confusions and the consolidations. But actually, you could actually get that through the internet as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I, was just think, I was just thinking about it just then, thinking, well, an alien could go online and think, God, human beings are crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that's very likely. But that craziness is part of our beauty as well, isn't it? And the, the, the platform that creativity and art provides allows that craziness to, to have a space in the world. And, and yeah, the internet's one space where that can sit, but equally it's about interactions on a human level yeah, nothing is out of bounds when it comes down to your creativity. And that's one of the wonderful things about it. And that's why people see the human condition in writing, because it takes uh, all of the human spirit in, and that, that includes madness, actually. People often say writers and artists are a bit crazy. Actually, everybody's a bit crazy, you know, at times in their lives. So, yeah. I, mean, I like that. Do, do artists and artists get, get that tag of being a bit crazy at times because they're actually just more honest and more expressive? Yeah, I mean, the artist is the person who puts down the knife and fork at the dinner table and says, well, okay, we need to talk about X <laughs> when nobody's talking about it, you know. So the artist will see the shadow behind the door. The artist will see the frown on the happy face or the smile on the frowning face. You know, the artist will see and perceive um, the future, um, and we'll be able to uh, relook at the past, and and is 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 comfortable with that, and so they will be defined as being a little bit crazy. You know, they speak out of hand. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> And so to our final poem for this series of The Aperture. Live Talk runs the spoken word stage at WOMAD and runs Project High Flu and the Hick Yak Poetry School. She's performed at the Word and Poetry stage at Glastonbury Festival and represented Exeter at the BBC's National Poetry Day celebrations. Liv's first book called Show Me Life is out and her next book, about climate change called Soggy is out next year. Thanks to Liv for her imaginative response to my conversation with Lem Sisse. Suppose in the centre of your living room is a puddle or a pond, smelly and deep, full of tiny fish luminescent scales, eyes like rose thorns and egg cups. 
they hear your conversations. Deep dive Netflix, scroll the tweets on your phone, analyze, extrapolate, internalize, each one a question, an idea, a truth that got stuck. When you leave the room, softly, gently, as not to disturb the surface of the pool, they swim out into the carpet, through the slats and the letterbox, the rot in your gate. They fill the sky like vapour trails, beat a steady samba on your eardrums, a call to arms from the gutters. But maybe today is not a good day. You can't make time, or someone told you once you couldn't, so you don't. Instead, you scratch them off like an itch, frantically turning circles until a thousand tiny specks of dust drop from your skin like tears, darting off into the capillaries of the world like your decision to ignore them was a heron to their hearts. Some of them you will never see again. Others will return to you in an echo, a whisper in a song, in someone else's words, that gives you comfort. At other times, they will fall from the sky like a star at your feet, rolling out like a carpet, an avalanche, picking up banners and placards, gathering static and reflections, until they are bigger than you, bigger than a planet. And you get to marvel at how that tiny fish you found in a puddle that flitted through your eyes like car lights passing a window at night gave permission to a lonely man, made a kid laugh so hard she hiccuped, went on to save a life, change a system, burn down a golden tower. That's it from me, Steph Cutler. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you don't miss a future episode of The Aperture on Apple, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from. Please like, share, leave a review and The Aperture can be found on Facebook and Twitter. This episode of The Aperture was produced by VI Podcasting. See you next time for more social change thinking.